coming in. Going around back. I got four. There's a huge bunch of people at D. Group 10 helps you get it. Hey all, this is Mikro. For those of you who don't know me, I've been a war veteran for the last year and I've been responsible for creating three of the four meta concepts for in terms of New World Wars. And I'm going to be explaining to you the ins and outs of every single aspect of a war and how that will be changing with the PTR. So starting off in terms of the basics of a war, a war is a 50v50 game mode that you need to push to get a declare which acts as a raffle like system in which if your company get selected to the raffle you can basically play inside of the war game mode so the war game mode inherently is a more elite less commonly played game mode in new world that happens at a specific time point per territory for each server it's a pre-scheduled event that people sign up for and then if you're selected in that event you will be given an invite to the war like much like any other game mode and then you teleport to it and that's where the war begins to in order to get this influence to enter in, in the raffle system you have to be in that company for at least three days before the war in order to count as in company and then you also have to be within three days before you start pushing in order for your influence to count towards the company you need to get 10% influence in the territory to be entered into that raffle system at all, and there is a weight component based off of how much that you pushed. It costs 5 to 15k per war deck depending on basically what siege that you want. I don't believe this affects how much the, the likelihood is, but there's not been a ton of testing on that, and it's very hard to test. But it will affect the amount of siege parts, siege parts that you have, which is important next patch on the PTR, but is not as important on the live patch. And if you don't get the declare, the leftover money is refunded to your company. This money must be taken out of the company treasury, which is why it's important for either a consul or for the governor to declare war when the opportunity to declare war arises. You could also view missions inside of your achievement for each territory, and this is a good way to track missions, and often missions are used in payouts for companies that own territories as a way to give back to people who pushed missions, which is unfortunately one of the least fun parts of the game, but it is a component that is necessary for the war system at the moment. Getting inside the war itself, it, war is a 50v50 game mode that consists of two armies. There are 10 groups of 5 per army, and on attack, you can have up to 25 mercenaries that could either be your color or the neutral color. So if you are, say, green and you are attacking purple, you could have 25 mercenaries that could be from yellow or from green, but you cannot have mercenaries from purple. These 25 mercenaries can be slotted like any other group, and there's no limitations on those, but the 25 people that are on your color need to be starting in your company and need to have been in your company for at least three days. On defense, this is lower to 15 mercs, and 35 people have to be from in company. When you get into a war, you'll be spawned into the war camp where there are buy stations and repair part stations. The buy stations will be interactable before the war starts, however, if you get kicked or if you disconnect for some reason, all of those buy station components will leave your inventory. You used to be able to trade these components, but people would essentially create characters, have them go into the war, get the consumes, trade them to someone, and then kick them, and would basically keep doing that. So they removed that system, so now you can no longer trade with people in the war camp. So it's really important to not take those war camp consumables until the very end. Typically people buy one haste pot and one cleansing pot off the start. When you buy a cleansing pot, it gives you three. They inherently have a 30 second cooldown. Haste pots have a longer cooldown. And both are important to the war itself. There are other things that you can buy that are more interesting on the PTR patch in terms of siege. But from a base perspective, generally you want to be spending your money on cleanse pots, and then enough hay spots to get back to the fight as quickly as possible. There's a 15 minute pre-war period and a 30 minute in-war period. In the war itself, you need to be able to capture three flags, which in which if you capture one of those flags, you could spawn at those flags. Defenders can no longer spawn at the flags, but they used to be able to. And then after you capture those flags, you need to break the gates, get into the fort, 
and then capture the actual point inside of the port in order to win. The point tick speed caps at plus five players for your team. So if you have 10 players on the point and they have five players on the point, that will be as fast or as slow, depending on how you look at it, as uh, as if they had zero players on the point and you had 10 players on the point. So basically the important concept here is in order to tick, you don't need to have your entire army stay on point. And instead it is better to control space around the point and make it harder for people to recontest if you're in a spot where you are actively gaining percentage on the point, which is indicated by the blue circle on the outline of the point itself. This circle will rotate clockwise, and once it has fully gone your color in a clockwise motion, it will be captured and you will be able to spawn there. Respawns happen in waves. This is tends to begin at 20 seconds and caps out at about a minute. There is a site called respawntimer.com, which can be used to track this very well and is often used throughout a war. However, it is not completely accurate and these times tend to jump when points are captured. This was introduced in a recent patch and it throws that respawn timer off a little bit. So often people will have a extra person sitting in call watching streams to see when the respawns actually are and will be announcing to people when those respawns happen. It is important to know when those respawns happen because if you die right after the respawns occur, you will be dead for longer than if you die right before those respawns occur. So gaming the system and trying to figure out a way to die right before respawns and kill your opponents right after the respawns is very important to winning wars. It is one of the main concepts that is used inside of the fort in order to gain an advantage from an attacker's perspective because wars tend to be so defensively favored. Point locations are outlined on attack on the right most side being C, then B, and then A, going from right to left. And then once you get into fort itself, this will flip and will go from C to B to A from right to left. It's kind of unknown why they flip, but it is a mechanic of the new world and it causes a lot of confusion. So it's important to know if you are, someone is talking about A, if they're talking about A point or A gate, because they are on two different sides of the map. In fort itself, you typically want to be able to get into fort with at least 15 to 20 minutes on the live patch and on the PTR patch, I imagine it will be a little bit faster, but will be about the same in order to have an opportunity to win in the fort fight. This used to be a much lower requirement when defenders were spawning on flags, but since the game has progressed and since people have gotten better at defending forts, it seems like you need more time to actually win the fort fight itself. In order to win the fort fight, there are a lot of steps that need to go right, but most importantly, let's start talking about the mechanics of fort. In fort, there are gates and there are siege. The siege are the little structures that are placed on top of the fort, and the gates are the big structures that prevent you from going into fort. In order to get into fort, the gates must be broken and siege help defend those gates. There are different kinds of siege that I will go into in a bit, but for now the important thing to know is typically when you get into the, the fort phase, you want to have your mages and ranged players prioritize shooting the siege, while your melee players prioritize breaking the gates. This is because me melee players can't actually break the ranged seeds because they don't have enough range to hit those siege. You can, it is also important to know that you cannot break gates before the points are ticked, but you can break siege before the points are ticked. So if you are on a point and you have nothing to do, and you're a ranged player, it's often a good idea to go hit the siege. On live patch, breaking defensive siege is higher priority, but on the PTR patch, it's less important. This is in particular in regards to horns. Horns on the live patch give a buff called Fortify, which will allow people to basically take a fifth of the damage that they normally would. Or sorry, they'd be taking four fifths of the damage that they normally would be able to take. But on the PTR, this was significantly reduced. The other thing that horns do is they give players a passive 500 second per health healing buff, which makes it very hard to kill defenders which is why it's so important to break horns before you take a real fight, and why there is so much emphasis on breaking all the siege before you really get into fort. Ice damage is also strong versus siege and gates, and should be leveraged with weapons like Ice Gauntlet. Defenders also have clench ups in buy stations, just like on attack, and they have four main respawn areas, and there are five on PTR. Each one of those respawn areas, except for the one on center flag, can be bought from. 
just like this on attack, you can also buy from the flags as well as in your war camp. So it, if you just captured a point, often people will run to the center of the flag, buy consumables, and rush to the next point. Generally, it is best to spread the army around each gate with about one to two groups per gate itself versus just trying to stack a single gate. There are some concepts in some metas where this changes, but this is generally the accepted practice for what is meta. And gate fights typically heavily favor defense, and the more players are on a gate, the more favored the defenders will be. In terms of what is typically done from a meta perspective, typically on the outside phase where you're capturing points or flags, there are two points that defenders actively hold because if they try to hold three points, there are circumstances that can result in a snowball where the attackers capture all three points. So often it is advantageous for defenders to sacrifice a point and instead focus on two points so the rotations between points themselves is relatively short. This is why this is normally done, and this rule is occasionally broken, but is typically there's just a free point that people will allow you to capture from an attacking perspective with the latest versions of New World. There are typically two point groups in an army, five to six main ball army groups, actually six to seven main ball army groups, and then two to three specialist groups. The main ball groups typically consist of par primarily brawlers, supports and healers and those are the main co main classes in an army itself with other specialist roles being placed throughout the army. Point groups tend to be in tankular builds, specialist groups tend to be lighter, and main ball groups tend to have a balance between tanky players and lighter players but tend to go for the more medium armor sets. In terms of classes that are played in wars, the three most typical classes are brawlers, which are also referred to as bruisers, supports, and healers. Those classes will basically make up like 80% of the army, sometimes a little bit less, and then there's other more unique classes that are played throughout the army as well, like tanks, which are often on point, disruptors, which tend to be in the backline trying to disrupt mages or ranged casters and healers, nukers, which are designed to blow up clumps with very low con, and assassin roles who mainly hunt out the nukers and hunt out healers and generally people in light armor classes. You typically need about 14 to 16 bruisers, 12 to 14 supports, 10 to 12 healers, 6 to 8 tanks, about 4 disruptors, and 8 kill squad members, which kill squad would inc include nukers and assassins. This fluctuates a little bit depending on the meta, but this ratio is generally about right. And controversial to what other people would say, bruisers are not just great axe warhammers, but can be other melee builds that are used to take space as well. But there is a fine line between a bruiser and a disruptor. The difference between a bruiser and a disruptor is bruisers want to be playing in the clumps, and the disruptors don't want to be playing in the clumps and instead want to be hitting the squishy people around the clumps. Bruisers tend to be a little bit tankier than disruptors, and disruptors tend to do a little bit more damage than bruisers, but they play in a very similar style and similar armor classes. Point players typically try to gain influence all the time on the point. These are also referred to as tanks, but this cannot be done without space being taken. Bruisers help create clumps, supports help kill those clumps, and set them up to be killed by basically putting negative effects onto those clumps and buffing the bruisers or brawlers on in their clumps, and healers kind of heal everyone. While this is all happening, point groups tend to go on point, disruptors tend to go into the enemy's backline and disrupt, nukers tend to try to hit the big clumps and try to blow them up as quickly as possible, but bruisers also help with that, or brawlers, and assassins try to kill everyone that is wearing light armor. Some rules break these rules, but these are typically the what happens in a war and typically the standard that people follow. Typically, when people are starting a war, they'll either send a whole army to the free point, which is something that the EU does in particular, or they'll send part of their army to the free point and keep part of their army in war camp in order to farm alt charge. This mechanic will no longer be implemented on the PTR patch, that would no longer be the case most likely. Or they split up and have smaller groups take the free points, or singular point, and they put their main ball on, on the B flag. The reason why people tend to go for the B flag first is because the respawn is the closest, but there are circumstances where people will try to get the side point first, and then from there work their way around the point. 
Typically, people go for the point that is closest to the respawn. So if you were to cap C, then you would go to A. Or sorry, if you were to cap C, then you would go to B, and then you would go to A. Or if you capped A first, then you would go to B, and then you would go to C. But there are some strats that change this, where splits are involved, where some of the army goes to the side point, and some of the army goes to the main point. And people try to create havoc that way. At the end of the day, there's almost always a 50v50 for the last point. And there's kind of no escaping this 50v50 concept. So in general, if you're not able to get in the fort, you have to be able to work on your 50v50 and try to improve the way that your army positions and take space in order to cre create havoc, tick the point, and capture it. Typically, in terms of positioning, disruptors are in the front or past the main line, and then tanks and bruisers are in about the same spot. Supports are a little bit behind them, healers are behind them, and then your kill squads are playing either behind or with your healers. Sometimes this rule gets broken, and it tends to not be static, and people tend to play in a radial fashion, so they will shift from left to right, but this is generally in terms of positioning from a radial perspective of where people will be playing. There are two main styles that people play for, and it is space control and clumps. EU tends to play for space control more, NA tends to play for clumps more, other regions from observations tend to play for clumps more as well. Space control is a more hard concept, but the base idea is that if ranged players don't have anywhere to cast their abilities without being hit by melees, they generally won't want to cast their abilities, so if everyone spreads out, then it will be harder for ranged players to play the game. This is why in EU, there tends to be a dominance of ball, where EU tends to run 45 bruisers, supports, and healers, and less of the specialist roles, and versus NA tends to run more of the specialist roles and less of the ball roles, because there's more space to work with things on NA than there is in the EU. The controversial part to that strategy is if everyone split up and you were to throw your entire army at one particular point, then the other team would tend to lose, which is why... EU tends to hold to what they call quadrants of the point, like the top left or bottom left parts, and they tend to give up two quadrants of the point. NA tends to like to zerg one particular quadrant or play for more compact zones where they overlap more and tend to overwhelm certain parts of the point in order to gain an advantage. In terms of Siege, there are three options that you can buy from on attack. You could buy a cannon, you could buy a repeater, or you could buy a firebomb. There are other different things that you could buy, but those are the three components of Siege. Typically, people buy the cannons on the live client, and the reason why they buy them is so that they have something to hide behind when muskets start shooting them. It's typically a thing that healers start try to buy, and they're typically not used. On the PTR, patches got changed, and cannons no longer, and other Siege no longer spawn at level 1, but instead spawn at level 3. What this means is you get about 150% damage increase on all your Siege, which means that cannons will now hit for about 8,000 damage instead of about 6,000 damage. In terms of other options in Siege, defense have a horn buff, which range depends on the Siege level, maxing at about 40 meters, and the actual Siege parts themselves are gained in increments of 300 per 10 minutes on each individual station, and these Repair parts are shared by everyone on your side of the army throughout the fort. Unlike war parts, which are just shared amongst your character. They're not shared amongst people in the army. People tend to prior siege first, and then they prioritize gates. Then people, after they break one gate down, will rotate to, their, to what is specified on the raid plans gate in which people typically create a plan on something called RaidPlanner.io, which kind of shows the top-level layout of New World, which I'll link to in the description below. And then they rotate around to the other gates and break them as they rotate until they end on their gate itself. Typically, when it comes to infort, people have a hard time getting through the gates, but once they get through, they try to prioritize breaking the shops and cleanse by stations as well as pressuring healers and taking space controlling the respawn zones, and then trying to get tick on the point itself. Typically, you need, in order to win the war, you have to fight, you have to win your original fight very decisively, as well as it being timed well with the respawn, get on point, start to tick, wipe the respawn, and then win it again. 
Depending on the time in the fort, you may only need to win once if you execute this correctly, or you may need to win three times back to back, depending on how much time is left on the clock and how long the respawns are. Which is why it's important to time your pushes with respawns to happen either just before or just after the respawns occur. Depending if you want to have respawns that die in the original gate itself happen, or if you want to have it so that everyone that dies is dead for a very long period of time. Depending on your strategy, you may want to crash either before that timer or slightly after that timer, and it also depends on what situation you are in in the fight itself. Typically, people will call an all-in on points and gates, but this will be happening at around the 80 to 90% mark. And if you call an all-in too early, then your clump will just get wiped and your entire army will lose. But if you call it in correctly, then you can overwhelmingly just win the point with that all-in alone, which is one of the most important parts from a shot caller perspective. Typically, on a regroup situation, people either get up top or get out, and this depends on your strategy that is usually defined by the person who is leading the army. Typically, you are able to get through these gates with a combination of bruiser pressure along with a lot of heals that need to be going to primarily to the bruisers in order to create pressure, and that pressure itself will t turn into space in which your supports, healers, and kill squad members can step up and take. The main concept is here is you need to be able to do damage to force people back in order to take the space itself, which is something that a lot of companies struggle with both inside and outside the fort. If you're not able to do consistent damage and force people out of your friendly space, they can wreak havoc on your healers and make it so that your main army cannot exist, which is why it's important to slot some builds in your backline, particularly with kill squads, that can dislodge disruptors and help prevent your healers from dying and why it's also really important to peel for healers. These are the main fundamentals of point. There are a few other things that are important in terms of comms. Typically, people will either use a quadrant system, or they will refer to things as top left, top right, bottom left, and bottom right, or they will refer to things as bonfire and opposite bonfire. The bonfire is a literal marker on the left side of B and A points, and on the right side of C point, and the oppo is just the opposite of the actual bonfire. When people refer to top and bottom, this ref the bottom refers to the closest spy to your either war camp or fort spawn, depending on which side you're on. Top refers to the side that's the furthest away from you. Right refers to your your right from where you spawn. Left refers to your left. The key thing is the base of the point always matches closest to where you actually spawn itself for these directions so that people don't get confused. These are the, the primary things that happen inside of Fort itself and I hope this was useful to you. I have other more in-depth guides for getting into Fort as well as some other specialist guides for Fort itself like repairs that I'll link in the description below but I wanted to do an updated guide for all the new members of the new world community that are joining for the most recent PTR update that's coming out. And I hope to see you guys all out in new world.